So recently I did a collab with my pal, audiophile creator, Josh Valor. As part of that project, I came away with this sweet ass pair of LCDX 2021 headphones from Odyssey. The price tag on these bad boys, a breathtaking $1,199 USD. I've now spent a few weeks with these, getting to know them, and I'm finally ready to talk about it. You ready? Let's go! So the setup we're looking at today is the Creators Package at about $1,200. It comes in what they call an economy hard case, but it feels pretty serious, and it includes a really nice single-ended quarter-inch to dual mini four-pin XLR cable. There is an option for an upgrade to a premium package that includes a balanced XLR, as well as a beefier Pelican hard case, for $1,699. I also used a balanced cable during some of my testing, the flow cable from Oppos Audio, which starts at $149.99. Oppos provided the cable as well as the headphones via Josh, and everything is linked down below in the description. These are some pretty big boy price tags here, but for context, the LCD X is not a flagship. Odyssey still has the LCD 3 at like $1,950, and the LCD 4 at just under four grand. It's really important to note that Odyssey has revisions from time to time, and this is the newest version version of these headphones. Now, I've personally never heard the 2020 version, but as both a fan of Odyssey and a consumer, I have researched them obsessively. If you want a great breakdown of the differences, and frankly, you really should if you're spending this much money on a headphone, you can check out a very thorough and well-executed video from Resolve Reviews over at the Headphone Show. I'll link it down below. So the first impression after you get past the locking flight case is just the general heft of these. It's tough to believe these weigh less than the previous version, as they still weigh right around 625 grams on my scale. For context, something like the HD 560S weighs right around 240 grams, and my usual main, the DT 1990 Pro, which is a pretty beefy package, weighs right under 400 grams. The big thing that jumps out visually are the pads. When I first tried these on, I was pretty astonished that these are the stock pads. These are big thick, light density foam, real leather. They are sharply angled from front to back, provide a really good seal. Ear openings are somewhere between a rectangle and an oval shape, and they measure like 70 by 50 millimeters on the openings, so they're really generous inside. The whole build is basically metal. All the parts appear to be user serviceable. Tensioning is just handled by these two posts. Not my favorite mechanism, and I never seem to get it right on the first go. Shockingly, I wear these at like three full clicks down from max. So all my big SpongeBob square hat ass dudes out there, you are a green light for these. The headband design is similar to pretty much any of the high-end Odyssey offerings. The length of this internal comfort strap looks like it would touch the metal of the headband, but in reality, it doesn't. I get just enough clearance to make it worthwhile. Outside of the cups, we have the Odyssey A design in all black with branding in silver and the planar magnetic technology verbiage on the bottoms. Cable connection here is split mini XLR. Cable is braided, pretty flexible, the splitter is somewhat minimal, and the quarter-inch plug is fairly massive. Now, your mileage may vary, but I would not call these all day comfort headphones. I mean, they weigh a ton, so you can throw all the plushy ear pads, clever design to avoid clamping force, all that you want at it. The initial impression is, wow, these feel really good. The reality is you're still supporting something on your head that weighs 625 grams. Where I start to feel it is at tension, right here in the base of my neck, it hits at about the two hour mark. So while I do applaud the magnet redesign and the sheer build quality of these, I can't say these are comfortable for long wear sessions. Or maybe I just need to stop skipping neck day at the gym. They're also strictly for home or studio use as they're simply enormous on the head and being big open planars, these leak sound to a really high degree. If you're not familiar with planar magnetic drivers, they're physically large drivers, usually capable of reproducing some deep and fast bass, low distortion and a pretty big sound stage. I'd love to show you some beautiful footage of the drivers in here, but much to my surprise, the pads are held on with double-sided adhesive tape. There is no clean, functional way to pad swap here. While I wouldn't go so far as to call this unforgivable, it is pretty unbelievable at this price point. Planar magnetics are also usually very power hungry, and surprisingly, these are not. I tested these on a few DAC amp setups, including my shit stack, my standard SU8 THX789 setup, as well as the Matrix Mini iPro 3 I got from Josh, and the iFi Zendac V2. We'll be taking a look at those latter two in upcoming reviews. But even the Zendac handled these, even in single-ended, at about 50% volume max, 25% is comfortable, and we're talking about an amp that provides 230 milliwatts at 32 ohms. That's nothing. For context, the shit Magni provides over 10 times that amount of power at 32 ohms. So these are shockingly easy to drive. Impedance is 20 ohms, sensitivity is 103 dB. Given their use case, I'm not exactly sure why. You could, but probably wouldn't use them for mobile. And I have to think that anyone with a $1,200 headphone budget likely has a pretty sick DAC amp setup. But 
You don't have to. The Zendax sent me down a pretty unexpected rabbit hole as well. I don't EQ my headphones. I take them all at face value. And that's kind of a luxury byproduct of owning a fairly large library of headphones. But the iFi stuff has this true bass button, which is a great sounding bass boost that I like on a large portion of my open back phones. With the LCDX, I like it sometimes, and other times it's too much, but it doesn't muddy up the mix and it doesn't overload any part of the range. It just sounds poorly EQ'd. It doesn't distort. The big reason for that is that the level of detail on the LCDX is absolutely insane. From previous research, I knew that the older LCDX needed some pretty in-depth EQ to make the most of them, which seems like a crazy thing to say about a $1,200 headphone. But this new version, to me, sounded pretty close to what I like right out of the box, with one exception. It lacked the low end I was expecting from these big planars, even for an open back. Not a lot, just a little. The highs have a little hint of sizzle somewhere I wasn't liking, which after some investigating was right around 14K. A touch. Nothing as heavy handed as the DT 1990s like 8000K siblings. Upper mids were a little recessed, which I naturally noticed more on female vocals. I don't mind that. I don't generally like a flat or a neutral EQ for music listening. I prefer something closer to the Harmon curve, but flipped. So more emphasis on the bass, less pronounced treble. I like something more like a V-shaped consumer EQ for most of the music that I consume, but a headphone has to be able to do that without distorting. This headphone is remarkably flexible and responsive to EQ. I truly believe you can EQ this headphone to do whatever you want it to. I will also include links to Resolve's EQ settings as well, and that really illustrates just how subjective this hobby can be. Do you need to EQ them? No, but you can, and they're very generous in how you can. I'm honestly shocked at how much quality, low-end overhead you have in these that's just absent from the stock tuning. Soundstage is pretty wide. I've heard wider. It has noticeable verticality, but I don't ever get the feeling of full center. So like that illusion of sitting in the middle of the stage really isn't fully complete. It's still very much a feeling for me of having two large speakers hanging in front of my ears. One of the things you said to me early on was you like hate red. As three of the four setups I use could be run and balanced, I will say that I generally preferred the balanced cable over the single-ended option. It sounded... Fuller? It could be placebo. It's a big topic with lots of nuance. My only caution on the Oppos cable is that the Rheen Mini XLR connectors don't come out as easily as the stock Odyssey cable. It's enough to make you nervous that something bad has happened until they break in a little bit. Now, value-wise, I honestly don't know how this cable stacks up versus some of the more affordable options out there, but it seems to be made from quality components. This was a tough review. Firstly, because I don't currently own any headphones that really compete at this level. These are essentially two and a half times more expensive than my usual daily driver and I haven't yet sourced an Aria or a Focal Clear, now I feel like I have to. The other challenging component was that with the changes to the model year, it left me in the unfortunate spot of having to research these headphones. The issue there is that you will inevitably run across commentary and reviews from other reviewers, which I think we as reviewers really try to avoid until after our review is complete because you don't want someone's opinion to color yours and you definitely don't want to inadvertently plagiarize someone. So I watched Resolve's review before completing mine. I didn't watch Josh's because we've been working together on this collab series. I didn't want to spoil anything. And then I died laughing watching Josh's review after because he echoed a lot about how I felt having watched Resolve's review prior to completing mine. It is one of the weirdest sequence of events I've ever found myself in as a product reviewer. TLDR, it's really confusing to the consumer to make major revisions to a product and not be 100% clear about what those are and if or how they affect the sound. So do I like the headphone? Absolutely, it's exceptional. It's like breaking out the good whiskey when company comes over. I would honestly be shocked if you found someone that reviewed this headphone poorly. For all its comfort shortcomings, it's impressively detailed, Great separation and layering. I like the tonality. I really like the fact that you can run it stock and it feels right at home in a mixing session or a listening session but you can really imprint some of your personal preference by way of EQ, and it stands up and delivers the goods without breaking a sweat. The fact that it operates with such little power is just a nice bonus. If you have the pockets, it gets a strong recommendation from me. I would absolutely spend my own money on this headphone. I wanna give a big shout out to Luster for sponsoring today's video. You probably heard of Luster before, but they're a free online shopping tool and browser extension that consolidates product info, 
pricing and reviews from all over the internet and puts it in one place just for you. So instead of watching endless YouTube videos about the best wireless gaming headset out there, for instance, you can go to Luster, type that in, then you can see the top five picks for whatever your budget is. Luster pulls all this data from review sources around the internet, places like ratings.com, Wirecutter, even Reddit threads. You can also see any special scores or awards, and you can click through to read or watch if you want to dig a little deeper. It shows you the best current pricing from the big online retailers, plus it can alert you to any sales prices, and it works right in Google or Amazon. Luster is totally free. It's easy to use, and it can save you a ton of both time and money when you're shopping for your perfect product. Click the link in the description below to get started. Big thanks to Luster for continuing to support the channel, and thank you so much for your time.